Dr. Claire Walker is the Manager of Public Programs and a Master Naturalist at Irvine Nature Center in Owings Mills, Maryland. There she installs and maintains wildlife friendly native plant gardens and shares her expertise with visitors. Welcome, Claire. Thank you. Uh, yes, indeed. I was very excited to do this because um, as well as my love of native plants, this is definitely hitting um, my love of birding. So one of the things I love about planting uh, these native plants, which I'll come to right at the end of the slides, is the number of native birds that it's attracted to my yard um, so that I can do so much birding in, in my own yard, which is wonderful. So, um, yeah, the, you might be able to tell that I actually haven't lived in the United States my whole life. Um, I did move about over 20 years ago now, which is a little worrying. Um, and I saw the, you know, some of these amazing birds, like the cedar waxwing with the fantastic little bandit mask here in my, uh, in my yard and got very excited. And I've just continued to try and improve my yard to make it more attractive for birds. So today we are going to talk though specifically about how we can help birds in the fall and winter time. Um, a lot of focus I feel on gardening sometimes can be on the springtime and a little bit more in the summer, um, but our birds need year, year round support. So we're going to cover that. Um, we're going to talk about why it's a good idea to help birds, um, which plants are the best. I'm going to talk a little bit um, about you know, plants more focused within the mid-Atlantic area, um, but I'm definitely giving you some resources. So if you come from other places, um, you can go to uh, one of the resources that uh, we're gonna share today is about the Homegrown National Park, and that gives you links to finding native plants to whatever region of the United States that you live in. Um, we're gonna talk about how garden and maintenance, your cleanup for fall and winter are so important in supporting birds, how we can make sure that if we attract birds to our yards that we keep them safe, because we certainly don't wanna bring birds to our yards just for them to get harmed. Um, and then we're going to look at what success might look like for you. So with birds, one of the really interesting things is you can hang feeders and get an awful lot of birds come to visit. So, you know, why don't we just do that in the fall and winter? Why do we need to worry about native foods? Well, it's kind of interesting because sometimes I actually do get questions from people who say, you know, I hung up my birth feeders and no one's come to visit. Um, and it would usually be in this kind of time period in September and October and the reason they don't visit your bird feeders at that time of year is there is native foods that they're going to instead, um, which kind of shows to me that birds actually prefer being able to forage um, natural foods and they don't want to hand out. They do want to find out, find their own things. But the other issue with feeders is that feeders themselves are, you know, not always the best things for birds because to keep birds healthy that are coming to feeders lots and lots of birds are being attracted to the same place um, and there's a lot of food there and so it's really important if you're hanging those feeders that you do disinfect them to make sure you're not spreading diseases um, so they need to be emptied and then soaked in a you know one part bleach solution you need to make sure you get rid of any old seed and holes because they can uh, if they stay there too long, they can get moldy and be bad for the birds. And then you've got to rake up and remove old seed because a lot of concentrated seed falling at the base of uh, bird feeders can attract you know, animals that we don't want. Um, so all in all, with all of those thoughts, sometimes it just can be easier to actually grow the natural food because then the food is in the perfect state of, uh, you know, freshness that the birds are looking for and it's got all the nutrition that they actually want rather than thinking oh are these is this actually the healthiest food for them so in early fall um in kind of the mid-atlantic area and increasingly so south from us there's a range of birds that you know you might get to see in your yard but over you know 
the last few weeks and into the next few weeks, these birds are actually starting to disappear um, and they're going to be replaced by a whole a slew of new birds. So we're going to have our winter visitors starting to arrive. So the fall and winter period actually covers a time period where there's a lot of change in the birds that you can support in your yard. And so because of that, I'm going to talk about lots of different options um, of things that we can do in your yard. If you don't know these particular birds, the one in the top right hand corner, my spot is a woodpecker. Um, but it's unusual because it is our only um, migratory woodpecker. So that's the yellow bellied sapsucker puts little holes in your trees. Um, we've got a white-throated sparrow on the bottom right, um, a junco in the top left, and there's a, a yellow rumped warbler that we're going to meet some more on the bottom left. But uh, before they've all left us completely, I did want to talk about those marvellous migrants. So these are the ones that um, can be some of our brightest birds to see during the year um, and they you know arrived in May spent their summer busily raising a new family or even you know sometimes one sometimes two sometimes even three broods that Earl have had during the summer and they have worked incredibly hard and now it's time for them to head to back to the um, their winter homes which can be just uh, the southern United States or central uh, Central America or even way down into South America. And to travel such a long way takes a lot of energy. So you might be wondering like how many of these birds are there in transit? And one of the things that was really cool that happened was the weather man, men wanted to develop much more accurate weather forecasts and they developed a system of Doppler radio, radars that are so sensitive that they can tell whether we have got drops of rain or drops of hail or drops of snow. And so these radar have absolutely no problem detecting flocks of birds flying over. And so in the spring and the fall, the weather forecasters are having to deal with Doppler radar signals that actually look like this. And these blooms of color coming up is actually huge flocks of birds taking off into the sky and uh, setting off. So um, birders quickly realized that they could use this data coming from the Doppler radar system to actually generate um, a bird cast instead of a forecast. So, you know, the, the fact that birds are flying in the sky. So I pulled this up. Uh, this is October 13th uh, bird cast. So a couple of days ago when I was putting together the PowerPoint um, and it might kind of amaze you, but 384 million birds were predicted to fly just on that night alone. Um, the color intensity kind of showing you how a lot of these birds were flying down the east coast. So these birds are flying and then if something like Hurricane Ian that we you know got the tail end of um, just you know the other week comes up through the mid-Atlantic area. Birds that are trying to fly south as soon as they hit that bad weather they actually will just land wherever they are um, because they're not going to try and fly into that bad weather and also when daylight uh, arrives they just look down around them and they're looking for a nice looking yard and they're going to come down and try and feed in that yard so every night through the whole of September and October there are birds that are in transition landing at daybreak looking for food that they want to eat and even, you know, this is uh, the same night I pulled in, uh, October 12th, that uh, these were the actual forecasts of birds that were flying over at the time. So at the time when I um, pulled this up, there were 19,000 birds in flight, uh, sorry, who crossed all the way across Virginia and 97,000 birds that were in flight. And they even have estimates of which birds are flying on any particular night. So on the right hand side, you can see there was magnolia warblers, eastern wood peewees, scarlet tanagers, and then all the way down to the wood thrushes and Swainson thrushes. So really exciting birds like flying through. But one of the things that this data has also 
about us to see is that the number of birds that are migrating every year has been declining um, quite startlingly. So since 1970, the estimate is that we've lost 3 billion birds, which is just a huge number of birds. Um, and a lot of these birds are the migratory birds. So, you know, 20, over 28%, almost a third of all uh, migratory bird species have declined. Um, and just focusing back at that Baltimore Oriole that we met, so two out of every five Baltimore Orioles have disappeared during that time period. Um, so these birds have got a long way to fly. Um, one of my favorite birds is the wood thrush. Um, because it has this beautiful song and I love when they arrive and going into the woods and hearing this song fly, this bird. Um, but these birds come to visit us um, in early spring, as you see, I'm running a little um, map that shows where birds, these birds migrate from. So they arrive in April um, in the United States, they spread through the whole of the United States and then in as the they get into the breeding season, they actually concentrate into the best areas to raise their young, um, which you can see is very much where we are. And then in August, they're starting to get ready. September, they're concentrating more, moving south. And then in October, off they all go. And they're all going to go back down into mostly the Yucatan Peninsula of the um, uh, Mexico. So in order to make that amazing flight straight across the Gulf of Mexico, um, they have to have huge fat reserves. So these birds can sometimes double their weight um, in the amount of fat that they're carrying. They spread it all over their skin so they can still fly. Um, and in order to gain that much weight ready for that big migration, they have to eat the right types of food. And the food that they're particularly looking for is high fat food. And that brings us to this, I promise the only graph I'm showing, gonna show you during the presentation today, um, which shows how much uh, native uh, berries are specifically designed to have this high fat concentration because these are the, uh, berries that these birds are going to hunt out. And there's actually been quite a few studies that show that even today, the, even though our woods are full of many invasive plants like multiflora rose and Japanese barberry and Japanese honeysuckle, the birds that have to migrate actually spend a lot of time hunting for the native berries. Um, the reason we know this is they catch those birds um, when they're in migration, they pop them in a little paper bag and then the birds go in the bag and some lucky person analyzes the seeds that come out. So we know exactly what bird uh, berries these birds are eating and the uh, berries they eat are native plants and if you look at the fat content of these plants you'll see exactly why so um, dogwood berries 38 34% fat uh, viburnum 48% fat spicebush 48% fat so that these really high fat berries allow them to really like bulk up and be ready for that all important flight back across the Gulf. Um, in comparison, as you can see, these non-native plants have less than 1% fat. They can be quite high sugar. And so some birds will eat them because they got like, you know, they can get a quick sugar buzz, but they are not going to give them the fat content that they need if they're going to successfully migrate. So for if you want to fill your yard with the kind of plants that are going to draw in those coolest of those of the migratory birds, so you know your um, northern or uh, Baltimore Orioles and you know warblers and and tanagers and stuff, having these native uh, plants that have berries are going to be just the great thing to draw them in. And some of these berries are, you know, these plants know that these birds are going to come in and birds are really great at dispersing those seeds because they're going to be flying around. And so they design them to be ready when these birds are looking for them. And the ones that are specifically ready right during migration includes, include arrowwood viburnum, the Virginia creeper, which I have a picture of here. Um, so this is a native vine, um, but even though 
it is a vine. It doesn't like damage property or trees because it just grows um, <clears throat> against the trunk of trees and it doesn't get into the canopy and like weigh them down and really hurt the trees. So it just goes up the trees rather than causing a big problem. And you can use a Virginia creeper as both a ground crop cover and then allow it to go up trees. Um, as a kind of direct replacement for English ivy, which is a plant that does cause trouble for trees because it gets in the canopy and makes them very heavy and blocks out light. Um, so you might not have ever seen the berries on Virginia creeper, but they do have almost grape-like looking berries on them that the birds enjoy. All of the native dogwoods have berries that um, birds enjoy, but the ones that are ready for these migrants are the pagoda, the silky, and the red osier or red twig dogwoods, um, spice bush, choke cherries. Um, and then if you have a kind of rougher area in the or a bigger piece of land that you don't mind having some like more weedy plants. Um, the pokeweed, a plant that a lot of us probably know because it does grow, is the name weed is kind of quite well done in a normal small yard. This is not a plant that you would ever want to let grow because it just gets really big um, and produces a lot of berries. And then you get a lot of um, new plants the next year as well. But if you don't have an area where that would be suitable for, um, it's a great plant to allow to grow. So just to look at a couple of these plants, if you don't know them, um, spice bush is a smaller understory tree, so it will grow in shade. Um, and because it's the spice bush, is, it has a really quite strong um, aromatic smell to its leaves. I really like it. It's one of my favourite um, plants for making teas from because you can make like a chai tea and they're both the native people and the early colonists would collect these berries and dry them because it really is a spice. It tastes a little bit like um, black pepper crossed with citrus. It's very, very tasty. Um, but for birds, these are one of those 48% fat uh, berries. And this is uh, spice bush is actually in the same family as the Laureaceae, and they have um, the uh, so it's the same family as avocado. And so I like to call them like the mini avocados of the woods because they have so many um, so much fat in them, and just one single big stone, just like an avocado. So uh, dogwoods, um, the some of the ones that maybe you haven't like come across quite as much, the silky or pagoda dogwoods, both have a lot of berries and of course beautiful spring blossoms as well, all of the, the dogwoods. Um, each, there's really a dogwood for each type of situation because some like more shady, some like more full sun, some like wet soils, some like dry soils. So um, I feel like there's a dogwood for everybody's yard. And the red twig dogwood is like this has this fantastic display of you know red twigs in the winter. So it's a just a gorgeous feature for any yard in the winter time. The viburnums, we have lots of different choices of viburnums for our yards, but uh, the arrowwood viburnum particularly has its berries ready for these fall migrants but has beautiful full color, color as well. And um, is uh, the, uh, so the, so it has beautiful full color. But the one thing with arrowwood viburnum is it's not deer resistant. The deer will um, eat the leaves. So if you, you know, when you get it established, you would do need to protect it until it grows above deer height. And then it's generally gonna have kind of like, you know, the um, multiple stems um, with the leaves above that, but you don't get like a low bush um, nurse with, if you have a high deer pressure, unfortunately. But you do get beautiful spring blossoms, as big balls of white. So some other uh, plants you could consider are the choke cherries, um, but which also, you know, again, have to be protected when they're little. But um, I find that these plants are pretty vigorous. And once they get well established, um, they do pretty well with deer uh, browse. 
So either the red or the black uh, choke cherry, both beautiful plants, and they, these two too can both be turned into a like a shrubby uh, hedge if you want you know they're, they're very responsive to being hedged if you trim them they're just going to send up more shoots and produce a denser hedge and you get this uh, gorgeous fall colors from them okay so that was my talking about uh, helping out our migrants did we have any questions on that section before we go into winter we did, Claire. Um, one of our attendees is wondering about Kausa dogwood berries and if those would be beneficial to birds. Um, so then certainly not as beneficial. I haven't seen many, much evidence that uh, birds eat the Kusa dogwood. Um, I've seen a lot of evidence that squirrels like them. <laughs> so um, you probably, you know, some wildlife is enjoying them but for the most part i think they're just too big for the birds to really enjoy the most of our native berries you know they size their berries so that they're a single bite for a bird because they want the birds to just like swallow them down um because for the plant the whole thing is that they're going to go all the way through the bird and come out the other end with a little pile of um you know manure to help them grow um in a new spot so uh, they're, they're usually the single serving size. Thank you, Claire. We've got one more question, which is, how can gardeners best contain Virginia creeper? Someone says that it has just taken over their yard. Oh, so that's really interesting because I wish I, I have a hard time getting mine to grow as vigorously as I want, which is like as a full ground cover. Um, I suspect you must have a position where it's really happy so it's getting maybe a bit more sun and um the um you know like a nice rich healthy soil so my uh, for me i found that i can it it gets very long but there isn't a lot of leaf the whole way along so what i tend to do with mine is i get it and i kind of get the ends of it and I kind of curl it back on itself because I want the ground cover to be thicker than if I just let it go thin. Um, but then if I, the places where I have a bigger tree that I'm happy for it to go up, I'll like send it up the tree um, or along fence lines. I kind of like it because it's you get such beautiful fall color with it. I really do like to have it, but um, I actually, I don't find it too hard to pull out of the ground because sometimes I accidentally weed it out. So um, maybe just giving it a bit of a pull or a cutback if you're finding it's, it's going to do much or plant another plant over the top of it, you know, a shrub or something that will give it more shade and then it's not going to grow anywhere near as vigorously. So, Thanks, okay. Claire. We will um, save the rest of the questions that are coming in for our next question opportunity great yeah so um like i said uh, over the next couple of weeks the last of the, the the big lot of songbirds will be have finished their migration and the uh, winter birds are arriving all the time and they are coming here because to find but because for them, you know, a lot of our birds migrate to the mid-Atlantic because they're coming from Canada. And for them, you know, we're a balmy, lovely destination. But they're still going to have to cope with uh, some cold weather and then trying to find limited food. So all the bounty of summer and fall starts to disappear. And they're going to be looking for mostly seeds, some more overwintering berries and then overwintering bugs. So we're going to look at how we can provide those for the uh, winter birds. So there are some specific berries, winterberry being a really good example of it, that um, the birds really don't eat until they've had a bit of a frost on them and it softens them and makes them sweeter, we think, for the birds. Um, but it's certainly they're not um, the, the berries that the birds pick off in the fall. They tend to hang around, which can be really nice, of course, because they can be a very decorative feature in our yard. And yet the the food is ready there for when the birds maybe need it in January and February. Um, 
some of our bigger birds like jays and of course woodpeckers and stuff will eat um, bigger food items so some of the nuts and acorns um, and even pine cones those little pine seeds in there are um, important foods then we don't really think about it but in the winter there's still insects available and a lot of birds are going to be hunting hard for those insects so for birds like tufted titmice that you might see in your yard they are really still um, insect eaters even in the winter um, and they are hunting for insects in many hidden places. Um, there can be insects hidden inside of leaves uh, like this American holly leaf, these little lines inside of here, these are little tiny insects and birds will like open up the bit of the leaf you see a little break in the leaf here where they've hunted for the um, insects hidden inside and then some of you might have heard of galls so these are extra bits that grow on plants because insects lay their eggs on the plant and it causes it to grow a gall the best known ones are things like oak apples but things like goldenrods get a lot of galls and the insects are actually hiding inside of these galls things like uh, downy woodpeckers really know that and they will open up these galls to hunt for a big fat grub inside of them and then of course um, seed heads are going to be so important for many of our smaller birds the sparrows the junco that comes to visit us they're looking for seeds so what are some plants that you could put in to give uh, berries in the winter time? Well, uh, before we started, I was actually talking about this berry, which because it's so close up, you might not even recognize, but this is actually a flowering dogwood. So Cornus florida um, and they, um, their berries, you know, are not picked off in that early fall period. They tend to stay through into the early winter through later winter. But uh, any place that has a lot of these flowering dogwoods, for me, is a great place to go bird watching for bluebirds because they seem to love finding it. it's the perfect habitat for them where the dogwoods grow um, and they'll be coming in and eating these berries through the winter. Then we've got uh, native hawthorns, uh, bayberries that I'm going to talk about, and some other types of viburnum, such as uh, possum haw, and of course, uh, American holly. So you might uh, uh, have heard of bayberry because um, it's become a, it's a popular, obviously, um, candle scent. And these berries are very waxy. If you ever get hold of one of these berries and rub it in your hands, it's kind of like rubbing your hand on a Crayola crayon or something. You get a layer of wax on your hands, but it smells lovely, it smells like bayberries. This is what candles um, were scented with traditionally at Christmas time. Um, a great thing about uh, the bayberry or wax myrtle, it's other common name, um, is that they can be semi evergreen so in my area um south of baltimore they definitely unless we have a really cold spell so one of those polar vortexes they do hold their leaves in winter but it does depend on the winter but we have a local bird called the yellow rumped warbler whose other name is also the myrtle warbler and that's because this is the only warbler in our area that actually stays year round so it will stay along the coastal areas and the only reason it can own overwinter in our area is it eats these berries so it's able to convert to eating berries and these you know really um, high fat again and so it gives it enough energy to uh, hang around in the winter so if you're especially along more the coastal plain areas um, and you plant this plant you might be lucky enough to get one of these visiting in the winter time native hawthorns are just beautiful in the springtime those uh, sharp thorns they're not called hawthorns for nothing um, really hold off the deer so I find this is a great plant to have in your yard and um, you can use it to make natural hedges to keep deer out of areas if you want um, but in the winter time this is a great place anywhere with hawthorns to see birds like um, this is the cedar waxwing that we were looking at uh, right at the beginning of the presentation so they love these berries um, winterberry that I mentioned uh, before because they stay on the tree a little longer um, will 
uh, make your yard they're really attractive for your yard but um this one is unfortunately do will browse so i have to give some protection to it in my yard um i just have um protection around it for the first kind of four and a half feet and so then the plant can grow taller than that um and unaided kind of thing the deer will leave it alone but uh winterberry is actually a plant that i am very interested in it has teeny tiny flowers in the springtime like all the hollies do but we actually have tiny native bees that are specialist on this plant so just to throw in my little bit because i I know I give a lot of talks about bees and trying to look after our native bees. So if you don't have a, if you have a yard that's big enough to have shrubs and you don't have a viburnum, I'm like, why? Viburnums are just fantastic uh, bushes to have in your yard. And some of these ones are the ones that um, I find the prunifolium and the lentago, so the um, nannyberry and black haw, the deer usually leave them alone completely they really don't like these two um by burnham so you can get a fully bushy plant all the way to the ground they have beautiful spring blossoms and then they have these amazing like black looking berries that hang in big droops um the other name for um the possum whore is also a uh, wild raisin um because of the way that they kind of shrivel and look so these again stay on the plant for a long time because the birds tend to wait until full winter before eating them but again beautiful full foliage from them now you might have heard about the fact that um some of these uh, berries the winter berry uh, eastern red cedar we're going to get to in a minute choke cherry and even some of the sumacs um they can uh ferment in the winter time so they kind of soften on a cold day and then the warm during the warm weather they you know um get warm enough that the sugars in them start to ferment and they actually can have enough alcohol fermented into them that some of our birds when they come along and apparently it's usually the teenage birds come along and they'll eat too many of these berries and they get so drunk from eating these berries that they can fall out of the trees that they're in um, so hopefully when that happens, they're over the top of like a softer surface um, because sometimes, unfortunately, there have been times when the birds you know, do get seriously injured if they fall onto concrete. Um, but it's a fairly unusual thing to happen. And it's just like I said, the teenagers that don't understand the risks of eating uh, too many fermented berries. Um, but unfortunately, we have also put a lot of berries in our yard that aren't good for birds. And the worst one out there is heavenly bamboo or nandina. And this has become a really widely spread uh, planted plant um, because it's so available at many of the big box stores. And people like it because it has these big droops of red berries and they stay a really long time because the birds don't eat them. And the reason the birds don't eat them is that they have cyanides in them. And if the birds eat just one, they'll realize that and they don't eat them. But these flocks of um, younger uh, cedar waxwings and um, robins and stuff, they tend to fly in groups of the you know this year's babies so they're the teenagers they're out exploring they're in a big group and later on in the year in february and march when there's not that much food available sometimes they'll land on these plants and then they go into kind of a feeding frenzy in the way that if you've ever had more than one dog you might understand like i have to eat it all before the other dog comes along and eats my food um, and they will eat enough of the berries before they realize that they're poisonous um that are having cases of these birds being killed by nandina berries so if you want to help birds one of the things you could do is not plant this plant at all if you've planted it and you want it for the foliage cut the berries off um, and then you won't like hurt birds but my preference would be like realize you've made a mistake if you have it dig it out and put a plant in that will help birds and not kill them 
Okay, another thing obviously we all want to have in our yards is uh, some winter colour for us. And the great thing is that these evergreen plants not only you know give us a bit of green in the winter, but they uh, provide a great place for shelter for birds on really snowy, cold, windy days. Now, um, I kind of put the middle picture in just for a bit of a joke because I always wonder what were these people uh, thinking when they planted their evergreen screen there. Um, they must really dislike their neighbours. Um, but the worst kind of screens to put in are these, you know, the non-native conifers that don't provide any food for our birds. Whereas instead of planting something that like that, you can plant ones that are native and are also then going to provide food for our birds. So you can plant a American holly with all its berries at the top here. And if you don't have space for the full size holly, there is now a cultivar, the American holly Maryland uh, cultivar is a low cultivar of holly. So you get all the advantages of evergreen, but berries as well. Similarly for um, Eastern red cedar, you could plant the regular eastern red cedar but there are now lots of cultivars of eastern red cedar that are lower um, and so provide shelter and food for our birds um, and one of those birds that are really going to love any of these berries is the uh, uh, catbird. So these ones, you'll hear them in the yards in the summertime um, so they're the ones that go Meow! And that's how they get their cat bird name. Um, and they're always diving in and out of the thickets um, like this, the, the evergreen trees. But this bird is kind of interesting. It uh, used to be that it wasn't a winter resident really in our area, that they were short distance migrants. So they just moved further south. But um, today with our warmer winters, this is a bird that you can still start to see in the wintertime hanging out in our area. So they need to be able to find uh, the berries in winter too. In terms of seed sources, um, I'm sure lots of you recognize on this side the purple cone flowers. So any of the echinacea produce these amazing seed heads that um, goldfinches love to sit on and pick out all the seed, um, as will any of the cone flowers, which is like the rudabecchia. This is rudabecchia fulgida, the orange cone flower. I love it because it's one of the last plants to flower in my yard. And on a mild winter, uh, these will still be flowering actually in my yard at Christmas. That's how hardy they are. But the reason these plants are so important is because of the seeds. And this is something so many of the small birds that visit us in winter are looking for. And those seeds come from particularly great source of it is goldenrods. Um, and there are goldenrods for every yard. They not don't have to be a weedy plant. You can get ones that stay small and clumped, have these amazing fall displays, and then they're going to have those beautiful seed heads as we just looked for. Or any of the native fall asters are also going to produce a ton of seeds um, that are just wonderful for the juncos and sparrows to be hopping amongst in the fall. So they, once they go to seed, this is, they're just as busy with birds as they are with pollinators in the fall. And the other thing that produces obviously a lot of seed is our native grasses. So native grasses, give a lot of shelter. They can have these kind of like loppy um, profiles here that you see with the prairie lop seed um, that gives places for birds to kind of scurry under the ground. We've got things like the um, panic grass, I mean, switchgrass here, panicum, um, that come in many different sizes um, today with like beautiful red tops. It, a lot of these plants are just really attractive in the fall and winter because they'll stand and give some structure in your yard. And then these little fluffy seed tops. This is little blue stem, which has beautiful blue colors and then gorgeous golden colors in the fall. So it's an all round wonderful grass to have in your yard. But when we do get hit bad weather like snow, these plants, the grasses, the asters, the goldenrods often kind of uh, 
arch to the ground under the weight of the seeds. So I have an area like this in my yard and after a bit of snow under all of these plants, it'll be packed down with little footprints because so many birds will have been scurrying around under these plants finding shelter. So it's a really great place to provide shelter in the yard. So I'm not focusing a huge amount of tree on trees just because um, if I were talking about supporting birds in springtime, then the trees would be my really big focus. But um, sm trees with very small acorns, like the pin oak, um, are really popular with a lot of uh, um, acorn feeding birds because they can pick up the whole acorn. So um, blue jays and stuff eat thousands and thousands of acorns and they're a hugely important food for them. And of course, pin oak has beautiful full color. This is the color and the beautiful shape of a pin oak. Um, the American beech tree over here also has beautiful full color. It hangs onto its leaves. So you get that those kind of golden uh, brown leaves all the way through until early spring. But uh, beech nuts are really popular with a lot of, um, you'll get huge flocks of grackles and things coming to, to eat those beech nuts and just lots of other birds. And the black gum tree you might know as it's spectacular fall displays, but did you know that black gums have black gum, these little tiny berries that are very popular with birds? Now, you can't just eat berries. You need the high fat and protein of bugs to get you through a winter. And the great places for those to hide out is anywhere where there's little nooks. So the bugs aren't moving around in the winter time. They're going to find somewhere that they can safely spend the winter. So what they're looking for is underneath uh, bark. Um, and so bark, trees with peely bark, like these river birches, just You'll see things like nut hatches just going up and down these trees, hunting underneath every one of those little peely areas, looking for bugs that have tucked themselves away for the winter. So anything with rough bark, uh, logs on the ground, and even dead stumps, of course, if you can leave any dead wood, there tends to be a lot of bugs eating those and all the woodpeckers are going to come for those. So when we're thinking about garden maintenance, trying to... The, big thing about birds is like just don't be too clean if you can decide to like sit on your couch and like you know relax and not clean up your yard you're going to leave so much more food we need to leave the leaves on the ground underneath the trees we need to leave you know those flower heads with all the seed tops on them and we need to leave some like um sort of fallen branches and stuff you can pile up if you want just into um, you know brush area all of those provide cover for um, insects to spend the winter and that's what our birds are going to be hunting through so um, I've talked about this in previous talks um, when I was talking about insects actually that um, you know insects through the summer are growing on trees like these uh, oak trees but in the winter, they need to come down off those trees and find a safe place to spend the winter. Um, safe for, you know, in terms of uh, most of the, some of them are getting through the winter. But in fact, most of them are going to hide in places that birds are going to hunt through and find and eat them. So these but they come down at the trees and then they're hunting around, but they don't like grass. They don't want to spend the winter in grass. What they actually need is what's called a soft landing, an area underneath trees where we leave leaves and where the, uh, all these insects are going to bury into the ground just below the surface. And so when you see cardinals going through leaves and flicking them all with their feet, what they're trying to do is flick those leaves and find the insects that are spending the the, the winter safely in the leaf blankets. So if at the bottom of your trees, you can have areas where bugs can come down out of the trees and safely spend, you know, not just grass, but like having areas with leaves and plants underneath those trees, that's going to allow a lot more insect areas um, for birds to hunt through. So finally, um, I you know, we I had that screen where I was talking about um, invasives being so bad 
um, in terms of they don't provide the right nutrition for birds. But most of the invasives that are out in woods have actually come because people plant them in their yards, are thinking that they're you know, pretty trees or plants for their yard, but unfortunately, um, the plants get spread into the woods. So in the wintertime when the birds get hungry, they do eat these berries, um, but they don't provide the right nutrition. A lot of them are too high in sugar and too low in fat. And they're going to spread and they actually start taking over the woods. Some of them like uh, bittersweet up here and Japanese honeysuckle down here. Um, actually, when they get into the wild, they climb up trees and they end up kind of strangling them and choking them so that they can kill mature trees and we end up in areas that just have invasives and no trees to support birds so fall is a really great time of year to like dig up plants and remove um if you have any of these japanese barberries um japanese um honeysuckles burning bush so Plants that you know are like not native, um, but you want to plant some of those plants we've talked about. Fall is a perfect time for planting trees and shrubs to get them established when they're not under the stress of having to look for a lot of water. Now you do, they do still need water if it's really dry in the winter time, but there just isn't the stress because they're not supporting leaves. And the whole winter, they're going to be establishing their roots and you know, getting ready for springtime. So they're going to be so much happier plants in the springtime. So I'm always really recommending that fall is the perfect time to plant new things or just, you know, divide plants that you already have. So it's a great time. You can dig out some of these invasives and instead, you know, divide what you already have or plant some new things that are going to really support birds with the, the uh, nutrition that they really need. So, and then I did want to just talk about making sure that when birds come to our yards, that we do keep them safe. So one thing is um, that when, if you're attracting birds to your yards, you want to, as much as possible, is not use chemicals because you can spray uh, chemicals that get into the bugs and then the birds eat those bugs. And if you've read things like um, Silent Spring, you know that it can have this cascade effect that things that, you know, aren't too terrible for, um, you know, lower life forms, they just get concentrated and can make birds very sick. The other thing is our houses are made with lots and lots of glass windows. And one of the really unfortunate things is that birds can't see glass. Their eyes just weren't formed when glass was around. And for them, it appears like you can come through and birds try and fly through glass. And unfortunately, millions of them are killed every year by flying into glass. So you can though help with this because it's usually just a very small number of windows that are cause most of the problems. So if you've got one window where you've had a bird hit, if you can treat that window, that one window, you're likely to stop any more birds hitting your house because that's the problem window for your house. Um, you can do things like add UV um, reflecting uh, stickers on. I have little dots that I apply. Um, anything that like, will break up large areas of window works really well. So we can't see the UV, but uh, birds can see it. One of the best ways, if you have a really bad window, you will get a lot of bird strikes, is you can um, add these um, like strings made from parachute cord just to hang in front of the window. So they're not very visible to people, but they stop birds flying into windows. But the number of deaths caused by window strikes is still tiny compared to the 2.4 billion birds that are unfortunately estimated to be killed by cats every year. So if you have outdoor cats, you really shouldn't encourage birds to come to your yard. 
Instead, both for your cat's safety and the bird's safety, it's better to keep birds, uh, cats inside, um, or you can build them a little catio to hang out in so that they can enjoy the outside um, without the risk of either them. It, today, you know, we have coyotes everywhere in the East Coast, and coyotes definitely see cats as a potential uh, food source. Um, so it keeps can keep cats safe, but it's also going to keep birds safe if you keep your cats inside. So I just wanted to finish with like a really easy example of how, things you can do in your yard just to make it, you know, more friendly for birds. So this is a backyard over here. Um, and so the whole back part of the yard, um, instead of they don't have grass anymore, they just like let their leaves stay. So they don't have lawn maintenance to worry about. They can just like use the leaves as cover um, to keep weeds down. Um, they've got some berries growing here. So this is a winter berry, um, just about to lose its leaves, but I can see it's just a young plant that's already covered with a lot of berries. Um, and then we've got a evergreen tree at the back there to provide some shelter in the winter time. This is a front yard, so they've kept more of their grass um, areas here. But in their flower beds, as you can see, they've uh, blown all the leaves from the flower beds just from from their lawn. Sorry, oops, from their lawn. Sorry, into their flower beds, um, allowing birds to come in and scratch through all of that. They've left all the seeds seeds um, on the top of their flowers, so they've you know left the dead heads and not. Uh, cut them back so that the seeds are there for the birds all through the winter and again at the back here there's a holly so we're providing berries and winter shelter with those so um, these might not look very different to a normal yard it's just that little things that can make your yard so much more beneficial for birds so I have a third of an acre um, and my house is in a fairly new development. We moved in 20 years ago. And one of the things I first noticed was that the developers had planted all native, non-native plants. So there was a Bradford pear, there was a crepe myrtle, there was a butterfly bush. Um, and all of those things over a few years we removed and then I replanted them with lots of native plants. So I put in some like baby oaks that are still baby, but are full of birds now um, and lots of those viburnums and witch hazels just lots a huge variety of native bird of native plants and for, to my great joy I maintain a yard list of all the birds that I see in my yard and this is just a few of those birds that have come to visit my little third of an acre since I planted it up with native plants um, including of course you might be able to tell my favorite bird um, is the American red start which is so seasonal for this time of year because it's the black and orange bird um, and it flicks its wings and its tail feathers all the time kind of fans them out and you get these flashes of orange as they jump around so energetically in like nice and low so they're very easy to spot so that's the reason why they're my favorite bird but yes I have a yard list of over 60 birds um, that have visited my little third of an acre just because um, I've planted so the message of this slide is plant it and they will come because when they, when the night ends and the sun's coming up, they're just looking for some place to rest and feed for the day. And that's when they'll come visit your yard. So um, we have some resources that you can um, look for the plants that are right for your area. Obviously, national organizations like the NWF and Audubon um, will give you lists for any part of the country you live in. in around the Washington, D.C. area, Plant Nova um, has a great list of plants you can put in to attract songbirds to your yard. Um, the Patterson Park Audubon in Baltimore has an amazing number of resources for planting to support birds in your area and if you ever need help identifying birds the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has an amazing app called Merlin so I can't recommend that 
too much. It, use, it, it can even identify their song. So, and it's really good. I just take it outside, turn it on, and it's like, oh, there's a, um, you know, it'll tell me a Swainson thrush is singing. It's just so cool. So, it's a very, very uh, clever app. So, um, thank you for attending. Uh, listening to me so you can probably tell i get very excited about birds this last year i was very excited because i spotted this bird in my yard which is a bread bernian warbler so again an absolutely stunning bird that i'll never get over how beautiful uh, the birds are in the north america but the most important thing if you only remember one thing from this talk, it's leave the leaves and you're going to feed a lot of birds this winter. OK, any questions? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, we have time for a couple questions. So one here is this person has a small area, three foot by three foot, and they're wondering what would be the best options of some of the plants we talked about for a, um, a small, perhaps even urban yard? Mm -hmm. um so i guess it's it it is hard because i don't know if it's sunny dry <laughs> shady um and if you how much height you want and how much time you've got to, to invest in it so if you want like something that you're just going to plant and then you don't have to do a lot more care of it then i would recommend a shrub to put into a space three by three but if you want like the most kind of attention stuff that you can look at through the um for a long time period uh planting it up with native plants that are you know perennials so kind of a good supply of those uh, goldenrods and asters and then maybe some spring flowers as well um you're going to bring in a lot of those smaller birds. So if you plant things like purple coneflower or any of the uh, Rebecca, so black eyed Susans, things like that, usually you're going to get a great view of um, goldfinches just coming and sitting on those heads to pull out those seeds. So yeah, the, the, I mean, there's a lot of potential, but it's, it's hard just because I don't have the details of, you know, the soil and uh, sun conditions. Thank you, Claire. Um, our next question is, someone is wondering, for window decals, um, should they be applied inside or outside of the window? Um, yeah, so for the best effect, they should be outside. Um, the um, A lot of times people want to put them inside. The If you... The, the easiest thing is if you have external screens, because that just covers the whole window and you don't have to worry about it. Um, I The decals have to be fairly close if it's a big window to, to give complete coverage. Unfortunately, birds are incredibly agile at flying. And if there's a small gap, if you think about that, there's a bush, they would just be like, oh, I can go into that tiny gap. They're kind of like in Star Wars when they have to get through this tiny mouth, they'll, they can just swivel around and get through very small gaps. So they will think, oh, I can go through that gap. So to make sure that uh, I don't leave a gap, they can get through. You can actually buy a little, it's a sponge pen. Um, like my kids used to have these sponge paint things, but it's a sponge thing and it has UV dots on. And for me, I found that's the easiest thing to do is I get one of these little sponge pens and then I can dot across and you can spread them close enough um, and then I have a few decals so that if I actually see them, I just see the decals. But um, I, the dots, I never see them and unless occasionally a, like light, sunlight right from the side at sun, sunset kind of catches them and I see them. But the rest of the day, they are invisible. So um, there's a really good solution for, that I found. Thank you so much, Claire. We'll have, um, we'll do one more question, which is, do you intentionally provide water sources for birds in your yard or do you suggest folks do so? Um, water will attract more birds than almost anything else in your yard. And they do, um, particularly in the winter time, they're often really hunting for water. It's hard for them to find. So, but what they, 
the biggest attractant is actually the sound of water. So if you just have still water, um, it's not as attractive to bring in birds as if you can have any kind of movement. So I had a big enough uh, water bath for birds that I had a little tiny solar um, fountain in the middle of it. And I set it on the tiniest like setting so the water just came up a little bit, but it would make enough of a drip that they would hear them. I know other people have actually gotten a, a gallon milk jug, filled it with water, put one little hole in, in the bottom of the jug and hung it from a tree above the water, their little water bath, and then it drips in. And it's the sound of water moving that really brings in birds. Um, I didn't cover it just because in the winter time, um, you know, you, you have to kind of heat your water if it's not going to freeze, although it has to be admit last winter, I'm not sure the water would have frozen in my bird baths all year. We had such a mild winter. Um, but it's kind of like the bird feeders. It's definitely a thing where you've got to think about if you put it in that you're going to regularly tip it out, give it a scrub out and refill it because quickly water, if there's a lot of birds going in and out, it's all those. Imagine if you had a foot bath by your door and everyone got their dirty feet in it as they went in and out of the door, how quickly that water would look really, really kind of not pleasant. So um, I tried to, to do it as planting the plants makes life easy for you. <laughs> Um, and putting in a bird feeder can kind of go, a bit, I mean, a water bath can take things back to, oh, I have this regular chore now because I've got to empty the water and fill it up. So, but um, yeah, definitely if you want to pull in more birds to see them, it's a great way of doing that.